Catherine is a PDH, PhD candidate at McGill University in the Department of Anthropology. Her ethnographic and historical research within dryland farming communities began in the high plains of the United States and now extends into the prairies of Canada. Her work focuses on the historical development of concepts within agriculture that continue to shape farming practices, including soil conservation. She focuses on how knowledge and technology move from the research stage to on-farm adoption by producers. Her dissertation work based in Southwestern Saskatchewan explores the relationship between the farming community and the Swift Current Research and Development Center from the time it was established in 1920. Catherine grew up on a sheep and cattle ranch in South Central Wyoming, but currently lives and farms with her partner near Fox Valley, Saskatchewan. In addition to producing organic grains, they also raise bison for direct to consumer meat sales. Catherine, welcome. Hello. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining our everyone for joining our panel today. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to speak to the NFU. I've admired and followed your work since I began my research in the Canadian prairies almost 10 years ago. Uh, so thank you again for inviting me. To begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm making this presentation from southwestern Saskatchewan, which is the part of the traditional lands of the Assiniboine, Blackfoot, Blood, Pegan, Salto, and Plains Cree, and part of Treaty 4 signed in 1874. My hope is that this acknowledgement will serve as a reminder to all those in attendance today of the important ongoing work of truth and reconciliation in Canada. The photo in the background of this first slide is of the Mutchler Farm, located off of Highway 21 near Fox Valley, Saskatchewan, in the southwest corner of the province. If you drove along the highway, you probably wouldn't take notice of this farmyard, which resembles hundreds of others in the prairies, with a few rundown buildings, grain bins, trees, and equipment. The Mutchler family no longer lives on the farm, and for many years, many years ago, they sold all of their land to another family in the area. There's nothing about this farmyard that would indicate the role it once served within the community of Fox Valley and the contributions it made to the development of dryland farming technology and science throughout the first half of the 20th century. The Mutchler Farm is also known as the Fox Valley Illustration Station and for older residents in this area is still referred to as the experimental farm. My presentation today is about the Illustration Station and others like it within Saskatchewan that were part of a large network of federally funded agricultural research stations all across Canada. I want to describe for you key aspects of these Illustration Stations that made them sites for creating community-based science. And next slide. Um, briefly to give you some background information about me, uh, which uh, actually you have already heard. <laughs> this research was part of my dissertation project, which is about the development of dryland agriculture. My work was primarily based in Swift Current, but I met and interviewed farmers from all over the Southwest. As an anthropologist, my work is both ethnographic and historical. Um, I looked at the historical development of practices that fall within the category of zero tillage farming, but also how these practices have shaped contemporary farming and farm communities within Palliser's Triangle. A large part of my research is also about the relationship between farmers and public agricultural science and extension services through time. Um, as mentioned, I focused my research for this uh, at the Swift Current Research and Development Center or the SCRDC. The photos that I use in this presentation are from an on-site archival collection at the station that I used extensively for my research. Next slide. SCRDC was established in 1920 as part of the Dominion Experimental Farm Service, service which started in 1886 with five original branch stations, um, uh, including one in Indian Head, Saskatchewan. SCRDC was established in Swift Current specifically to address the issues arising in the semi-arid brown soil zone with soil erosion. This region was particularly affected by drought, crop failures, and farm abandonments that characterized the late 1920s and early 1930s. After it was established in 1920, 
SCRDC, as a branch station, oversaw the research activities of all the illustration stations in the region, including the Mutchler Farm and Fox Valley. In 1939, the Canadian Experimental Farm Service described the network with the following quote, the, the Dominion Experimental Farm System may be loosely compared to the hub and spokes of a wheel. The hub is the headquarters at Central Farm in Ottawa. The branch farms and station divisions are the main spokes, while carrying the influence still further afield are the substations and 195 illustration stations. The branch farms and other outlying units are in contact with the public continually, cooperate and co cooperate with extension men and serve in many ways. They are close to the farmer and the farmer uses them. Most of the research activities in the region were carried out by the scientists working in Swift Current. However, the illustration stations were used by those same scientists as additional test plots for new crop varieties, equipment testing and field scale experiments. The branch stations created agreements with local farmers to rent a portion of their land for these experiments and to compensate the farmer for their time and labor carrying out the various projects. Many of the illustration stations were expanded in the mid 1930s with funding from the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Act of 1935, also known as the PFRA, and became then known as substations. Next slide. E.C. Sackville was in charge of the illustration stations that fell within the purview of, the, of Swift Current during the 1930s. And in a seminar delivered at the Swift Current branch station in 1937, he described the criteria utilized when choosing where to establish illustration stations. His main criteria included finding a progressive and practical farmer who was interested in experimental work. Ideally, the farmer would be well regarded in the area, which would help increase neighbors' interest in the activities of the farm and help to promote new soil conservation techniques. Second, the farm needed to be located along a well-traveled road and in a prominent site so that neighbors could easily observe all the activities taking place. Finally, uh, the projects chosen for each illustration station should be geared towards issues of local interest to the community. And these issues could be, could be identified by the operator, such as the Mutchlers. Not only would this help the branch station with comparative work across different soil types, but it would also help in creating community interest in the illustration farm, as well as the branch farm in Swift Current. In my interview with Marvin Mutchler, the grandson of the original operator, and through my archival work with annual reports and seminars about the illustration stations, I honed in on three primary, primary characteristics that made these farms powerful sites of experiment, uh, powerful, yeah, made these farms powerful sites of experimental work, knowledge transfer, and community mobilization. These three characteristics include public witnessing, crossing boundaries, and building alliances. Next slide. Public witnessing within science began in the 17th century as researchers would gather a group of gentlemen observers to witness experiments and verify results. The intention behind witnessing was to distinguish science as categorically different from alchemy, which intentionally kept methods and experimental conditions hidden. In the context of agricultural research, Christopher Henke, a sociologist working in the US, considers witnessing field trials a foundational element to the success of extension work because farmers can observe experiments within conditions and soil types similar to their own. Illustration stations offered ample opportunity for witnessing, particularly because farmers were already engaging in a practice Robert Burton calls roadside farming. Roadside farming is the way in which farmers gather information about their neighbors' farm practices by continually observing fields, equipment, and farmyards as they drive along well-traveled routes and look out from their vehicle cabs. Sackville from the Swift Current Station was well aware of farmers' penchant for roadside farming, which is why he listed the prominence of the location as one of the key criteria for illustration stations. Although branch stations, including Swift Current, held annual field days to give farmers the opportunity to tour their experimental plots, illustration stations offered farmers the opportunity to, build, to view experimental fields on a weekly or even daily basis. Next slide. 
The results of these observations were also much more meaningful because farmers knew the weekly conditions of growing, including levels of rainfall. The results also had a greater impact because, because neighbors knew the farmer operator who managed the land. When I asked a current SCRDC scientist about the role of illustration stations and extension work, he replied, knowing the ability of the operator and the quality of the land is what mattered. They knew the land, they knew the man, and they could predict their own success accordingly. The Mutchlers were well known in the region. And when I interviewed Marvin, the grandson of the original operator, he described how much attention his grandfather and father paid to the overall appearance of their yard and fields. He believed that this was in part because everyone is, was observing their farm to form opinions about the experimental practices, crops, and technology. He thought that his father felt pressure to keep up the appearance of the farmyard to maintain his standing in the community as a good farm operator. Uh, this photo here is from, this, is from the Fox Valley Illustration Station. Next slide. Although I couldn't find a photo of the Fox Valley farmyard in the archives, I did find many photos of farmyards, homes, and gardens of other illustration stations. In the reports that accompanied these photos, it was clear that branch scientists encouraged illustration operators to maintain well-organized and tidy yards, such as the one seen here from the Gravelberg substation. What became clear to me is that the scientists were interested in analyzing more than just experimental trials on the fields. They were also interested in life on the farm. This leads to the next important characteristic of illustration stations, what I call crossing boundaries between social life and science. Next slide. Right from the start of the illustration stations, but particularly during the Dust Bowl crisis of the 1930s, the branch station scientists and PFRA took an interest in many aspects of farm life that would now fall well outside the purview of science. In the annual reports from the illustration stations, I found data collected on the condition of orchards, the number of trees planted for shelter belts, the annual harvest of home gardens, the number of eggs collected from each year from laying hens, and the purchase of home appliances such as washing machines. Results of this information were sometimes provided to farmers during events at the illustration stations, including economic assessments to help families interested in expanding their homes or buying new cream separators. Here we see another photo from the Gravelberg uh, substation showing a new orchard that has just been planted. Next slide. In this photo from Shonovan, an illustration station operator poses next to his newly constructed grain bin. As we can see from the original photo caption, some on-farm projects were more successful than others. In the reports from the late 1930s and early 1940s, I often read the line, giving permanence to communities and families in the context of describing the goals of this work at illustration stations. Branch station scientists and directors were charged with not only stabilizing the unruly field surfaces that created dust storms, they were also given the task of stabilizing communities. This helps to explain why they were collecting data on both the state of field surfaces after using a noble blade, as well as counting eggs and canned tomatoes. Next slide. Annual events held at illustration stations also helped farmers and scientists cross institutional boundaries because these occasions were designed to encourage socializing with the intent to build tighter bonds between the groups. In the same seminar from Sackville that I mentioned earlier, he also discusses the importance of making annual field days enjoyable events for entire families. I've included this photo from Limerick because we see men, women, children, and even a dog taking part and posing for a photo. Marvin Mutchler remembered these field days more than any other aspect of his childhood participating in his family's illustration farm. He described for me how they would set up a huge tent that was filled with food contributed by all of his neighbors. Um, my husband's grandmother told me that she remembers tasting bananas for the first time while attending a field day at the Mutchler farm. Even as a 93 year old woman, she still remembered biting into a banana cake as a child and thinking it was the best food she'd ever tasted. I found photos of rodeos held at the Mutchler farm as well as de events designed specifically for women. Next slide. 
As you can see in this photo, during a field day at Gravelberg, a speaker was brought in specifically to address women and discuss with them grades of bacon hogs. Next slide. Because these events were both social and scientific, this helped to make illustration stations the perfect site to mobilize the community during the Dust Bowl to assist in projects falling within the category of emergency reclamation. Most of these projects were designed by the PFRA and carried out by groups called agricultural improvement associations, which were farmers groups mostly organized through illustration stations. By 1937, there were 109 ag improvement associations with a membership of 14,000 people. These folks met at the illustration stations regularly to exchange information about various soil conservation practices and technology, to distribute seed, including crested wheatgrass for immediate pasture reclamation, and to organize seeding and listing bees to share equipment and labor. Branch stations and the PFRA use the illustration stations as centers to build alliances with these farmer groups and to assist in their work of stabilizing badly eroded fields and in stabilizing prairie communities. Next slide. Only you have about five minutes left. Okay. After my interview with Marvin Mutchler, I also recognized the importance of the illustration operators in terms of collecting data and helping the station scientists analyze the usefulness of their various projects. Marvin recalled for me that his father made notes on a day-to-day -day, on the day-to-day -day conditions of experimental plots and fields to give the scientists a more complete picture of each growing season. He explained that as a kid, one of his jobs was constantly checking the dam rain gauge and recording his readings. Because the operators were fully immersed in the day-to-day -day conditions of the experiments and knowledgeable about their own land and soil conditions, they were best positioned to help the scientists make sense of the countless variables that contributed to the successes and failures of any given project. Additionally, because farmers had extensive technical and mechanical skills, they could be given a crash course on new implements, such as this demonstration of a one-way disc at Gravelberg, and the operators could implement experimental protocol without the assistance of scientists and branch technicians. Next slide. Branch scientists recognize the importance of building these alliances with illustration operators and harnessing their skills as contributors to the scientific process. In a seminar delivered by Bill Harding, who worked on plant improvement projects in Swift Current, he described this alliance with the following quote, cooperative experiments with farmers would seem like the most satisfactory arrangement for this type of work. And it may be best carried out by agricultural improvement associations. Work of this kind would likely be beneficial in a double way. We would, in the first place, obtain a more thorough understanding of the value of our various treatments under different conditions. At the same time, we would have at our disposal the advice of individual farmers in respect to various treatments. This phase is most important. In most cases, the farmer himself has established the principles by which we conduct our farming activity. By working together, both experimentalist and farmers should certainly benefit. As we can see in this photo from Fox Valley, the contributions of these illustration stations and their operators undoubtedly helped in perfecting many of the practices that now fall under the umbrella of conservation tillage. Without their assistance, the branch stations would not have had access to the wide breadth of data across many soil types and climatic conditions that help them build comparative research projects. Next slide. To conclude my presentation, I'd like to briefly discuss the current situation in terms of community science harnessed through the power of illustration stations. Not only have all of the illustration stations throughout the prairies closed, but the majority of branch stations have also closed. Saskatchewan once had seven independent branch stations, but now only two remain, including the one in Swift Current and one in Saskatoon. Some of the closed, uh, in addition to closing many federal research facilities, the government also scaled back most extension positions and activities in the 1980s and 90s. At the same time as they were cutting direct ties with farm communities, they also began matching init investment initiatives with private agribusinesses and provincial governments to support research projects. I describe the timeline of these changes in my dissertation include that and conclude that overall this has led to a distancing between the farm community and federal agricultural research network. 
This close relationship has been replaced by closer relationships between branch stations and farmers with private agribusiness representatives than they have with each other. I conclude in my work that this has greatly limited the possibility of innovative research within the federal network and limited the ability of those scientists to address some of our most pressing issues facing the prairies. It has also transformed farmers from the role of partners in community science to consumers of information and products mostly delivered through private entities. As Yvon Martel says in this quote, if the first hundred years were marked by a continuous expansion of research infrastructure and budget, the ensuing 25 were characterized by the need to increase efficiency. During the 1990s, the private sector became increasingly involved in priority setting and the financing of research. <laughs> this is not to say that all field and field day and extension events are no longer held at branch stations. I've included a few photos of events from Swift Current and Indian Head. However, however, these events do not offer the same opportunity for public witnessing, crossing boundaries and building alliances that were foundational to the work of illustration stations. During the Dust Bowl, numerous strategies to address soil erosion evolved from a co collaboration between farmers and scientists that took place at illustration stations. This resulted in a bloom of equipment, practices, and conservation associations that all helped to stabilize the prairies. Without the network of stations to facilitate collaboration between farmers and scientists on a local level, it's difficult to imagine how a second bloom in farming technology could ever occur. I'll conclude by saying that we may need to find inspiration from the century-old illustration station model to prepare for the next hundred years of agricultural research and farming on the Canadian prairies. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Next slide. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, awesome uh, information, and, and it just makes me want to reflect on those principles of public witnessing or crop touring, as we call it, uh, as well as crossing boundaries between social and science uh, and building alliances. And I it just makes me reflect on the NFU and where we came from and, and where those principles uh, fit into who we are. So thanks so much. And we look Thank forward you. to having you join our question period uh, in a few moments. <laughs>